Well, a very good evening to you. We welcome you this evening to our live uh, broadcast. My name is Dia Mudley. I'm the pastor of uh, Spirit of Life Reformed Baptist Church here in uh, Bristol, United Kingdom. And uh, I have with me my dear brother in Christ who will introduce himself now and bring your greetings. Brother. Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad to be here with you all. And thank you for the invite, uh, Dia. It's always glad to see you. And uh, yeah, I'm Adrian Pillay. I'm a pastor at Calvary Covenant Fellowship in Durban, South Africa. I serve with two other elders, my dad and uh, Pastor Tyrell Pillay. Glad to be here as well. Well, um, you know, greetings to you wherever you are in the world, wherever you're watching this. Um, a special greetings to our South African audience who may be tuned in tonight. Um, it's been a a journey over this last a year or so. We first covered this when we heard about um, Silver Moodley's death. And um, if you remember, uh, brother, uh, there was nobody else uh, covering this. No, none of the churches in Durban were covering it. And it was you, myself, and uh, I think uh, two other brothers who uh, were contributing to this. And it's been now, what's it, 579 days? Indeed it has. It's been a long time. Um, I don't think the family has come, the immediate family has come to terms with what has happened. Uh, and I say that because uh, from the pictures I notice them not being at the funeral, but I stand to be corrected on that. We've had not enough time to really look at that issue. Mm. But 569 days or well, even 500 days is way too long. Indeed. To have been Indeed. A lot has happened since then. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, uh, have become very bad enemies of ours for raising the issue with uh, Silver Mudli. Um, but also on the on the good side, a lot of people have found the broadcast that we did very helpful. Um, and you've had some people also talk to you about that. Yeah, well, firstly, we had the threats, uh, had a few threats. Uh, in fact, those calls are recorded, uh, mm. very interesting calls, but it's important that we keep focused that this is an issue that goes beyond all of us. It's an issue of the honor of Christ, the honor of the church, and the public mockery that's made of a gospel through men like Silver Mudley, who promote such a gospel. Um, there are people who have been uh, helped by this, uh, been at, have been in much conversations by those who started to question these issues and glad that the Lord in his providence has made this an opportunity to help people go back and read their Bibles. And so simple the solution is read your Bibles. Indeed. Yes, indeed. We've had, we've had a lot of good uh, feedback, uh, a, a lot of negative feedback, a lot of uh, threats, like you said, but um, it's, it's par for the course. We went into it very soberly. We knew what we were doing. And even tonight, um, I want to just put the disclaimer out there. We are in no means trying to disrespect uh, Jesse and the, the children of uh, Silver Moodley. And uh, we, we recognize that uh, you've lost your husband and a father. We, we, we do recognize that. And, uh, but we do want to address, as we did the last time, uh, the false teachings of Siva Mudli and how it has impacted um, hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, all across Africa and wherever his TV program um, was covered. And we do know that uh, as I look at many posts and, and, and uh, Facebook articles about him, there are a lot of people that were listening to what he had to say. and. I do believe he had a, um, a fairly good audience, even in South Africa, who were attending the church, but I think also a bigger audience um, via his uh, television program. So please um, know that we are addressing this with the greatest love and respect, and uh, we um, want to put that out there before we begin. And so um, as, we, as we begin to talk about this, it's been, like we said, uh, the article today from Destiny Church says, uh, and, and, and this is on the social media. This is on the public platform. So we're not taking any information from any private source. This is, this is public viewing. So Destiny Church uh, put out on social media today that it's been 579 days. Uh, they have buried um, um, the Siva Mudli uh, either, either yesterday or today. I'm thinking it's today. And uh, th there's a whole lot of things said about that in, in the post, which um, my brother Adrian and I want to talk about now. If you'd like to contribute to the program tonight, please uh, drop your comments in the comment box and, and, and Adrian and I will try to uh, read that as best we can and we'll try to answer your questions. Uh, please try to be respectful uh, as you make your comments uh, and uh, we will try to answer them as best we can. Now, let's just kick off tonight by, by, by saying, as Adrian uh, said, um, 579 days, whether it was even 500 days, it's, it's too late. So we recognize that um, there was a reason why they were waiting so long to uh, bury the man. 
Adrian, um, what was their thinking behind this? What was their doctrinal belief? What was their, uh, what was their, what was their belief that were holding holding the family back from from burying him? Well, that's uh, quite interesting, and it's not just their belief. Uh, I'll probably mention one or two of the previous Word of Faith preachers that also taught uh, taught and believed in the same manner. So <clears throat> I was not too much aware of Sufum Woodley. I heard about him in passing many times in the past. And when this incident occurred, I decided to go into medical TV and uh, listen to some of his teachings and listen to what was happening at that stage. So I started off at the point where the daughter was mentioning that uh, the father uh, was, uh, well, she would say simply this, that he's gone to heaven hmm. and the Lord had told her, and this is uh, where she will gain her authority from. The Lord had told her mm-hmm. that uh, her father will come back and right. will have great stories of heaven. And this is not something that I'm making up. It's on video, it's on Miracle TV hmm. in their sessions that they were sitting on their seat because that was COVID times and they were probably not having in-person meetings. Yeah. Uh, and so I went back further to listen to Silva's teachings to see why his daughter and his wife would think in such a manner. Yeah. And it go back into many of his teachings. It, it wouldn't take you long because there's nothing new about these things. Uh, it's not original. It's just an old area in a new garment or in a new face of a person that's doing it. And he would teach things like uh, one of the most astounding thing that I was surprised by was that uh, Christians uh, should not die of sickness. Mm-hmm. And uh, they will uh, they not die of sickness because they have the power to decree and declare and to claim their healing. Uh, they probably will die of normal deaths. And so he would speak in his uh, sermons, or if you would call that sermons, about how whenever he felt something wrong with him or sick, there was sin in his life. Mm-hmm. And he would find sometimes DVDs at home that he would need to have to burn. And so... For the family to admit that he died is firstly to admit that he was wrong in what he preached. He was yep. false. And secondly, they would also have to admit that he had some sin in his life or something was drastically displeasing to the Lord, which is why he became sick hmm. and then he died. Yeah. So these are the things that held him. And so they decided to pray and have what they would con- consider as faith for his healing and for his miracle. And this is not too much different from Corbus von Rensburg many years back. Prophet Corbus von Rensburg believed and taught the immortality doctrine that uh, uh, we shall live and not die. Yeah. So he quoted on him being in an accident in, a, in an ambulance and he quoted Psalms that I will live and not die. Eventually he died of cancer, I think. And uh, they kept his body four days in the church. Right. Uh, they, they put on ear- earphones for Corbus so that he could hear his own preaching. Oh, wow. And eventually they set his funeral date. At least that was four to five days later, which is a reasonable time. Yeah. But so far, uh, I think they went into a point of really being adamant and stubborn. I mean, I'm hearing stories that they still bring his suit to church on a Sunday morning. Wow. The church service, expecting that he will probably fill that suit and uh, appear back to the people. Mm. And so this is the devastation. It's not devastating enough that they've lost uh, their father or their husband, but they have to put themselves through this turmoil to hold on to a false doctrine. Mm. That's more painful than anything else. And I think it's a kindness to talk about this, to help them be relieved from such a turmoil that they're going through. Yeah. Um, if you've just uh, joined us, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Dia Mudli. Um, I'm the pastor teacher here at uh, Spirit of Life Reformed Baptist Church in Bristol, United Kingdom. My brother, Adrian C. Pillay, is uh, pastor teacher at uh, Calvary uh, Covenant Church there in uh, Durban, South Africa. And we're so glad to have your company tonight. Thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to contribute, as many are doing right now with their comments, you, you're more than welcome to post your comments, uh, your questions, your queries, your concerns. And uh, we'll, we'll try our best, the Lord willing, to answer um, uh, most, if not all of them. And so um, we're talking today specifically about um, the burial of uh, Siva Mudli. We know that many people have uh, asked about this, and uh, over over the over those 579 days, uh, there've been uh, a few posts and articles about it. I think we, uh, Adrian and I, have have covered this uh, more than um, anyone else has done uh, to to bring awareness to what is going on and to try and help people uh, who are in the church, in that church, or who are following uh, Siva Mudli's uh, teaching. And if you've missed the introduction to this little uh, broadcast, we said that although we'd received many um, 
threats from people about what we were posting, and, and we were being very respectful and loving in our posting. Um, although we'd received many threats, I think it was the people that had, whose eyes were opened after we did the first broadcast, their eyes were open to the teaching of Silver Murti through the broadcast. I think that was um, really, really uh, beneficial, and we were very pleased with that. And so, um, in a similar light, we, 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 bring, the, we bring you this uh, broadcast. And let's, before we, be, before we carry on talking about Silver Murti, let's talk a little bit, Adrian, about this idea, this idea that, um, and, and we take from Destiny's um, Facebook page, that uh, now that they've buried him, uh, he can now rest in peace. Um, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because a, a lot of people are just saying that, um, rest in peace. It be, it's become a, uh, just a regular rhetoric at a, at, a, at a funeral or when you talk with somebody who's died. Um, rest in peace. Now, there's a whole lot of questions that can come from that, right? Um, so uh, does his burial, does, he, does him uh, going into the ground and, and sand put over his, his coffin or his, uh, or his uh, sand you know, put over his grave, does that make him rest in peace? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's the important point, and you're right. Uh, <clears throat> it becomes uh, a normal thing to say to anyone who has passed on, "R.I.P., mm. rest in peace." But can every person just rest in peace? And that's the question. We know from Scripture in Hebrews nine and verse twenty-seven, for it is appointed unto man to die, mm -hmm. and then, then is the judgment. It's not mm. five hundred days later a judgment, or five hundred days later you enter into paradise. Yep. But there and then is is a judgment, and man has to face his maker that god who created heaven and earth and through jesus christ saved a people for himself mm. he has to face him and reckon with him mm. and that's where the idea of peace should come from i think job asked it right how can a man be right with god yep. it's a very important question and i think the question that man should be asking am i right with god and that's the only way you can have peace because Paul describes this in his letters and the scriptures describes this, that we are enemies of God. We are in, uh, strangers and aliens uh, to the commonwealth. And we are rebellious people who hold up our fist against an almighty God. And so there's no peace, there's war between sinful man and a holy God. And any man who dies in that sinful state is still mm -hmm. at war and in rebellion with this God and he will face this God in judgment. Indeed. And so that person does not rest in peace. Indeed. But for a man who is saved by faith in Christ, he's at peace with his Savior. He's at peace with God. Mm. And so when he died, we can now say with great confidence as we throw the soil onto the coffin uh, that he is resting in peace. Mm. So that's an interesting thing because, um, like you rightly said, and we pointed out, a lot of people just say that um, because they've heard it said so many times. And if they were. Uh, Christians watching this tonight hopefully um, will become more aware of how to, how and when to use these words. So uh, RIP, uh, we know uh, rest in peace in that exact order and those exact words are not found in Scripture. Um, it's a Latin phrase, a Latin uh, terminology, um, uh, which, which really says um, uh, requies, requiescat in pace, requiescat in pace. So RIP, rest in peace. And uh, it was, it's normally it's normally like a, a prayer or a saying that is said after the person has died and almost in a way praying that this dead person would now rest in peace. And, and we find that uh, Christians have adopted it into uh, the church. They've adopted it into their, their funerals, uh, thinking that it's a, a good thing to say. And now we, we have problems with that uh, because like you rightly said, um, we find rest and we find peace only in salvation in Jesus Christ. And so um, there is no rest in peace in the Bible. I think the only words uh, that we find rest in, or we have the word rest, when you look at, for example, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, he said, but as for you, uh, go your way to the end, then you will rest and rise from your, arise for your allotted portion at the end of the age. So there we find the word rest at the end of uh, uh, Daniel. A, a, in Isaiah 57, verse 1 to 2, it says, um, The righteous person perishes, and no one takes it uh, to heart. And devout people are taken away, while uh, no one understands. For the righteous person is taken away from evil. He enters into, into peace. Uh, they rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. And so we find there 
um, this is the this is the lot this is the end result of all those who are believers in God there's this there's this rest so we can we can truly say then for um, for those without Christ there is no R and there is no P there is no rest and there is no peace um, isn't that what you were, what you were just saying exactly because we go back exactly to uh, creation and we even see that in the fourth commandment about the Sabbath when we were created we were created to rest in God we were created to bask in the glory of God in an eternal Sabbath but through sin man was cast out of the Garden of Eden and exiled from the presence of God mm -hmm. therefore scripture from Genesis 3 all the way to consummation in Revelation is, is the plan of redemption of Christ accomplishing it eventually in the fullness of time so that we could enter into an eternal rest that Christ becomes our Sabbath in that sense so that the goal of creation which was a Sabbath rest for man basking in the glory of God becomes the goal of redemption mm -hmm. which is the same thing so the goal of creation if I have to rephrase it was worship the goal of redemption is worship and that is to bask in the light of God and in his glory which is what we see in the book of Revelation chapter 21 now a person who is not come to faith in Christ does not have that as is if I may use this uh, movie title final destination he's not going in that direction yeah. so we cannot loosely say for him to that he is resting in peace and so this comments have been given to silver so like we're not trying to make a judgment call here that's left to the judge of all who will do right at this stage but from the evidence of what we see and the evidence that Jesus gives us about how we can mark out and identify his disciples silver moodley does not display the fruit of being a disciple of christ and therefore we cannot say rest in peace indeed yeah that's a that's a, a good explanation and uh um, i love um i love what our catechism says concerning uh the matter of the state of man after um the fall uh, question 19 talks about you know what is what is the state of man after the fall uh, all of mankind is in sin and misery and um, man will continue in that misery without Jesus Christ um, he's miserable because he's separated from God uh, he has no fellowship with God and therefore he's in a state of misery and, and no matter how much he says he's happy and no matter how flashy his car is or how much money he has in his wallet at the end of it all he's still miserable because He's not in. He's not in relationship with God. He's not reconciled to God. Therefore, he's in a, a state of misery. Um, that state of misery uh, can be extended even further in the sense of the troubles of his life. Uh, this, his his body is sick. Um, he's toiling hard in the ground. Uh, by the sweat of his brow, he's working. And this is this is going to continue all the way through his life. Uh, he's miserable in pain and in sorrow uh, all the days of his life. And he's miserable because he's scared of death. Uh, he's scared of what's lying on the other side of that and so man without Christ is in a state of misery And so we therefore cannot say to this man who is outside of Christ all of his life And he dies outside of Christ all of his life to now say to that man He's resting in peace uh, because he's certainly not resting in peace because he he doesn't have the peace of God with him He, he didn't have the peace of God with him uh, when he was alive and certainly will not be resting in peace uh, after his death and wouldn't you agree then that this, this is things people try to tell themselves at a funeral just to make themselves feel pretty comfortable and happy uh, that this person is going to the right place maybe the other things that they also say well um, um, uh, you know he's one of the angels now or he's kind of sprouted wings now I, I'm not sure whether we hear that in the Christian church but uh, I do hear some things of this in a, in a, in a, in a non-Christian environment where people who don't even believe in God will now say that this person is now in heaven um, do, do you hear things like that? Well, <laughs> well I hear heavenly birthdays. Okay. <laughs> I hear those things. I hear, oh, now he's with uh, his wife or with his husband, even though the scripture says there's no marriage or giving into marriage. Right. Uh, they speak about every family member. When a person dies, he's going to meet this person. And if the persons were, if they were believers, yes, that's a great joy to meet them. But the first thing that should come out of our mouths is they get to see their savior. That's where we tend to miss what heaven is all about. Heaven is heaven because Christ is there, not because my brother and sister and family are there. That's the joy of joining with the myriads and with every tribe and nation and tongue. But our focus, as the psalmist would say in Psalm 73, is who, am I, who have I in heaven but thee? Mm. And on earth there is nothing I desire but 
be. Yeah. And so I think we lose focus with all of these fancy things of what heaven may be like. It's all speculation, by the way. Yeah. We should be tied to the scripture as to what the scripture describes heaven is and yeah. nothing further than that. But my, my big concern is why is the day of our death looked upon so badly? Yeah. Why is Silver Woodley and those teachings of the word of faith trying to run away from death, which one writer says is the is the one of, okay, actually Ecclesiastes 7 says it, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the Puritan writers says it's that moment of being closest to God, or closest Amen. to heaven. Amen, indeed. So uh, we found that the, the funeral was done. Uh, there's a lot of people posting in, in different ways or sharing from uh, Destiny Church. And I think you've uh, challenged them also today on the matter of what they, they, they wrote and, and we'll give you an opportunity to, to speak about that uh, now. So you said uh, something about them um, uh, where they were declaring and decreeing something. Um, could you expand a little bit on that? Well, not necessarily. Well, I, I, from the little I know of Destiny Church, I know they were of faith uh, as well, so they would use this. But a lot of from what Silva Moodley comes from behind uh, from the men that were doing the funeral. I've, I've seen videos of, I think it was Pastor Cyril, but uh, a few videos he recently did where I decree and declare that you will be rich, uh, that you will not, there will be no sickness in front of, uh, you will get no sickness, things like that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's one of, that's not new again. Yeah. That has been in the Word of Faith movement from Kenneth Hagen days. Right. And this decree and declare thing, we've seen it even recently when Basil Tryon died and the new guy that's taken over from Basil Tryon, he's already declaring, uh, I'm saying it the wrong, like how they say it, he's already decreeing and declaring contracts and business contracts right. against people. Right. Uh, that's that's the concern. I mean, what is the decree? What is uh, declaring? And is it scriptural? That's that's the question we must ask. Why is the church so loosely using these phrases? Uh, well, taking bit of Bible. And, and syncretizing it with selfishness. That, I, want, I, want, I want you. I want to just hang on to that point. There. Just hang on, to the, hang on to that selfishness point there, because that's pretty interesting. Because whenever we hear this declare and decree taking place, uh, whether it was the Silver Mudley, Basil Tryon, Alan Joseph, Paul Lutchman, <coughs> whoever they may be, uh, Rayma Church up there in Johannesburg, uh, Kenneth Copeland from the States. We have people in the UK doing the very same thing. Uh, Chris Ayoki Lome, all these people. You'll find them declaring and decreeing things that they covet rather than, for example, yeah. if the declaring yes. and decreeing really works, why aren't they declaring and decreeing evangelism or declaring and decreeing discipleship or declaring and decreeing saving a nation? Or for example, declaring and decreeing in South Africa um, that uh, the gospel be spread or the, in, in the United Kingdom, the gospel be spread. But you find very often that it's a declaring and decreeing mostly a, in a covetous way to, to, to cover what they do not have and to accumulate and amass like you saying, these contracts and this wealth. Um, so, yeah, you you are you're right about that in the sense of selfishness. That's true. Um, you jumped me into thinking about James. Mm -hmm. James speaks about prayer. So, for me, there's probably many reasons with the decreeing and declaring. Uh, I find at least two things that are big issues here. One, it has a very low view of God's sovereignty. Two, it has a very low view of God's authority. Mm. Mm. Three, if I may add a third one, it has a very low view of prayer. Right. And that's that's the thing, because Jesus commands us, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be opened. Mm -hmm. Jesus does not command us to declare and decree things to come into existence or to fulfill our uh, selfish desires. And mm -hmm. while saying that, let's I want to look quickly at James, yep. James speaks about our prayers actually, because not only is it uh, an issue of decreeing and declaring, it sometimes comes out while a person is praying. Yep. I declare that you will have health. I declare that you will get this job. And so what we are doing in all of this is we are overestimating our authority. We are asserting ourselves in the place of God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even in, in the place of scriptures that are describing other events and other people, and we make it about ourselves so yep. it's about self-centeredness it's about selfishness mm. that's what james warns us against in james chapter 4 he says you desire and you do not have mm. so you murder you covet and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel yep you do not have because you do not ask 
Uh, James says you don't have because you don't ask. And Jesus says, ask and you will receive. So right. what do the selfish person then, then them? He asks and he declares and he decrees and he claims and he names and he grabs and whatever terms they would use. But James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And then in verse 3 of chapter 4, he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly with, with the wrong to spend it on your passions. Yes. And he calls us call such people you adulterous people mm -hmm. that's the problem yeah and then first john chapter 5 as well he says you pray but you do not pray according to god's will mm. now that's the part of taking authority god asks us to ask him he's a good heavenly father that gives good gifts to his children yeah but like a good father he knows what's not good for you he also knows what he has planned for you sometimes we ask for things that are not according to his plan and we should be content that the good lord will do well and would give well the problem is the devil has come and says what has god really said doesn't that look very nice on that tree yeah it's good for you and you'll be like god so what do we do or what do such people do they use up the authority of god and they assert and overestimate the, the authority and they start to speak things into existence and take the place of God. Mm. That's a very, very scary thing to do. Yeah. And 10 out of 10 times, mm. <laughs> 10 out of 10 times, they don't get what they want. Yeah. I mean, I hear, I hear these pastors say, you will be healed and not be sick. And I, these same pastors were holding prayer vigils for other pastors who were struck with COVID. Yeah. And those pastors died. And it's strange that people would still follow. Yeah. Strange. Well, well isn't it also interesting? It, it's, I think it's interesting also that people will follow it because they're, li they're really chasing after something for themselves. They, they're really, um, we, we, we've, we've often looked at this in the you and I over the years. We've tried to see why people are, are aligning themselves with these men who, who are clearly false teachers who are declaring and decreeing these things. Why are so many people flocking to their churches? Why are they amassing such a lot of people uh, in their congregations? Well, one of the reasons is uh, it's, a, it's a supply and demand. They're, they're drawing people who are exactly like them. They're drawing people who, who actually are not content with their life. They're not content with um, what God has blessed them with. They're yeah. seeking, they're coveting after something else. And so they're going to these churches really to, to manifest their own covetous nature, to manifest their own carnal nature. So, it's, so, it's a, so, so two things are happening here. One, there's a people that want to be covetous. And two, there's a man speaking that wants to answer that covetous nature by saying, oh, well, let's declare and decree these things like this man is doing at Basil Trine's church, declaring and decreeing contracts and so forth and so on. And like you rightly said, it's mainly about wealth. It's mainly about an earthly prosperity. It's mainly about accumulating things here on earth, wearing the Gucci and the Pradas and all the other stuff to show that you are blessed of God. I'm last night I did in my service uh, in the evening service, uh, midweek service, uh, talking about how Paul talks to the church in uh, First Corinthians, uh, and almost sarcastically saying to those who are saying, "I am of Apollos and I am of Paul and I am of Peter," he's saying to them, "You become kings, you become rich, uh, and almost like wearing your crowns already." And he says, "But as for us, we are the scum of the earth. As for us, we are poor. We are not clothed. We are." looking for homes we are hungry and we're thirsty uh, because he's identifying he's letting them know that we are truly servants of god uh and, and we follow after our servant king we follow his example that he came to bring to us that he's indeed a servant and he he he, he manifested that uh, uh the servanthood ultimately by laying down his life on the cross but even before that uh getting down on his knees almost uh, stripping and washing the feet of his uh, disciples and truly that being a servant but what we see now is uh, not really a servant attitude or a servant nature or a servant example but it's more like ceos and presidents and i think you would agree then it's more like trying to be like the world uh, so the church then has these um, accolades that must be measured uh, by world's uh, standards Indeed, that's true. Uh, and the, uh, remember, I come from that background as well. So I mm. come from a prosperity, charismatic, word of faith background. I grew up in it. I, I spent many a nights and many a years in it. So I understand 
what people are listening for and just grabbing a hope. And that's the problem. They're grabbing, them, they're grabbing a hope that the writer of Ecclesiastes describes in this Hebrew word, haval, which is a grasping after the wind. Mm -hmm. You have Solomon there, the wisest man in the world, who gives himself to all of the wealth. He says, no one will ever achieve what I've achieved. And I found that it is a vanity. Mm -hmm. He says, I give myself to wisdom and I find it's a vanity. I've given myself to hard work. I find it's a vanity. Mm -hmm. he eventually in chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes sums up the entire matter. matter. He says, the end of the matter is this. It's not wealth. It's not all of these things that I've tried and uh, amused myself to see if it gave me that fulfillment because what he did say, all of that was a vanity, a, a vow, a grasping after. It's like trying to catch the wind in your hand. It's a waste yeah. of time. Mm -hmm. So he says the end of the matter is simply this. Fear God and obey his commandments. Mm -hmm. Fear God and obey his commandments. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's uh, lacking in all of this. It's not a fear of God. It's a, it's, it's a what I want. And God is this great cosmic bending machine that will give me what I want. Yeah. So yeah. That's my decree and declare as this coin in the machine. I declare that I will get D2 and that must fall to my level. Yeah. And even if we can just follow up from that, there may not be enough time for us tonight, but even from that, we recognize the great danger. And that's why you and I uh, over the years have been uh, trying to uh, bring attention to this because people like Durban Christian Center, um, um, you know, Clive Gopal there in uh, Overport, and uh, I hope, hope I get the names right or the locations right, uh, Rayma okay. Church there in uh, uh, Johannesburg side have been bringing people like Miles Monroe, Benny Hinn, uh, um, and I've been bringing people of the Word of Faith movement to to preach this kind of gospel. And, and we've had that in, in the generation before us. So, you know, some of them are still alive who used to travel up to Rhema, who used to get those words uh, uh, come from either Miles Monroe or Carlton Pearson and all these kind of guys and bring it down to Durban and other places and disseminate it through small churches. So every small church, whether it was in a backyard or in a, in a, in a hotel or in a classroom or in a big building, was getting these teachings from the U.S., this Americanized gospel. Uh, that was not really a gospel at all, if, we, if, we, if Paul addresses it. It's not really a gospel at all. It's nothing, really. Uh, and but it went into every small church and i remember that time um people the pastors that we were affiliated with would travel much to rhema and durban christian center and places like that so these churches brought these men over and really were teaching this kind of teaching and has led i do believe tragically to uh, a false gospel a false conversion and i see what we're seeing in many churches and you and i have been talking about this and even as we speak with people when we engage with them over what they're listening to in their churches, they very often respond like an unbeliever would uh, and respond in a way totally clueless about Scripture, totally clueless about how to, how to harmonize one text with another. Uh, and their immediate response is almost like a scratching of the face. Uh, don't point at us. Don't try to judge us. Uh, and like the one lady said to me today, um, I, I must be careful that the wrath of God uh, doesn't come upon me. And, you know, so he immediately the response would not be to discuss scripture or to uh, or to reason over it, uh, but merely to just respond in that way. But that's that's the secondary point. I think the primary point is that it's led to false conversion, uh, a false gospel, a false conversion. And we're seeing that right now. I think what we see with Siva Mudli is exactly that. Um, what we see with Siva Mudli and similar type of churches is exactly that. Leading people to a false Jesus. A Jesus who can bless you with this, 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 this. A Jesus who can bless you with that, 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 that. Therefore, come to that Jesus. Now, I'm not a big fan of altar calls. We used to have them. Uh, uh, but if the offer goes out, come to Jesus and he will give you a better life. Come to Jesus and he'll give you that car that you want or that job that you want. I mean, people will stick their hand up everywhere and say, I want to sign up for that. I want to sign up for that Jesus. Why? Because I'm living in poverty. I want to sign up for that Jesus because I want to do better than my neighbor. I want to sign up for that Jesus because I see how people live in the U.S. I see it on TikTok and YouTube. I want to live like that. So if Jesus can give me that, sign me up. And that's how these churches get full, by signing up like that. Uh, you won't find a preacher saying in these churches, come to Jesus and you'll suffer persecution. Come to Jesus and there'll be a sword between you and your parents, or a sword between your brother and your sister. Come to Jesus and you'll be dragged on hot coals in your pilgrimage through this earthly life. We never hear them say that. Uh, what we hear is an offer 
of a pseudo heaven on earth. Uh, and that's why yeah. people like Jesse Duplantis and all say they don't want the gold in heaven. They want it now. They want it here on earth. And I think uh, I, I think uh, Silver Moodley was in a similar type of teaching because we know he followed people like Jesse Duplantis and Copeland and Benny Hinn and people like that. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's uh, an addition to what you're saying. Exactly. Um, and that's the point of it. And you, you made the, the important point. When you come to Christ, Christ says, if you desire to follow me, pick up a cross, not a bling cross, not a cross with diamonds and gold on it, but a cross of shame and suffering and follow me. Because mm. as he suffered, the Christian life, Paul says, is suffering. Mm. Paul also brings it about his suffering. And the problem with all of this word of faith is this. It's summed up in Joel Austin's book title. Yep. They want you to have your best life now. Yep. And a person who wants their best life now is actually denying what the Savior said. Yep. Your best life now, according to the Savior, will be one of suffering. For many trials and tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life will suffer. And that's what's been offered to you. And no one wants it. That's why the way is so narrow and very few find it. Because it's not appealing to the eye. Mm. Because the Christian life is eyes of faith, not eyes of sight. Yeah. And, and, and that's what's not been preached to the people. I, I, I remember when I was, I was much younger, and I had this youth leader who was trying to teach us evangelism. And we went to a very poor man's house. Uh, his lights was cut. He could not pay his bill. We were standing outside the house. His wife was sick. My youth leader looked upon this man. He says, uh, you've tried everything. And he was not a Christian. You've tried everything. Your wife is sick. You have no money to buy food and to pay your light bill. His next words was this. Why don't you give Jesus a try? Wow. Yes. That's not the gospel. Yep. That is not the gospel. And if that man gave Jesus a try, as my youth leader would have said at that stage, and he found out that nothing came right, what would he do? Mm. He would go to the next religion. As long as the payoff is good, mm -hmm. I'll take your God. Yep. And that is a false gospel, isn't it? That is a false gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It is truly misleading. It's truly dangerous. And we're living with the consequence of that now. We can see it in uh, um, uh, the generation that is rising up in these churches um, that have drawn from that teaching. They've sat at that fountain. They've lapped up the false teaching that has come from that. They were soaked in it uh, for all these years. And even teaching their, their very same, their children of their household, the very, very same things. Their children are hearing these kind of things in their parents' prayer about declaring and decreeing and so forth. So we're raising up another generation of people who f believe in a false Jesus. A false uh, Jesus in the sense of the person and the work of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, um, thank you so much for those of you that are watching. Uh, Carl Joshua, thank you, uh, brother. Good to hear from you. Uh, Raven Haynes, I'm not sure where you are listening from or following from, but thank you for your, your, uh, your, your scripture reference. Um, our brother Bobby, always good to hear from you. Brother Raymond Stewart from Northern Ireland, um, thank you, brother. It's good to good to have you with us this evening. Um, um, let me see who else is on there and help me, uh, Adrian, if I've forgotten anybody. Um, there's Carl Joshua. Um, uh, Adrian Schaefer says uh, they will heap for themselves preachers that will preach to their itchy ears. That's correct. Uh, Selvin Sean Moodley from East London, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, there are many others watching. Uh, you can very easily post your question or your comment. If there's time, we'd love to uh, answer them for you. Uh, and if you've just uh, joined us, my name is uh, Dia Moodley. I'm the pastor of Spirit of Life Church here in Bristol, United Kingdom. My brother, Adrian uh, Apile, is the pastor of Calvary Covenant Church in Durban, South Africa. And uh, we're so glad to have you with us this evening. We're talking the matter of Siva Moodley and his false doctrine, especially today as we've come to know it's uh, his his body has finally been put into the ground. He's been he's been buried uh, 579 days after he died. Now a lot of people are outraged about that and saying that he deserves a dignified funeral. Now we're going to pick up on that and we're going to talk about that. And people talk about a send off. Uh, help me understand this, brother, because. Who's sending who where? And what authority do we have to send anybody anywhere? I mean, we're, yeah. we're Christians. We, we, you know, um, as we've just said earlier on, it is God who gives life and God who takes life. What authority do we have to send anybody anywhere? Okay. I've got so much of comments to make on that with regards to a funeral service for starters. Mm. And I think you witnessed some of my challenges here in South Africa when yes. you came down to be at my side when mom died. Uh, so a send-off 
more often apart from where the destination is that we're thinking of is more on how elaborate the funeral can be super moodily i don't think he had that much of a elaborate funeral but maybe we can touch on the point as to how believers should even have their funerals because the send off includes an expensive casket expensive cars funerals that cost way too much but the sad part about it is not just the cost is that the funeral is made too much about the person instead of christ <laughs> instead of the lord yep uh powerpoint presentations of them and their life um that that's 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 the sad part so the send off is basically this big party or celebration or reverend party where this loved one will get send off to where mm. uh, it's not a send off by the way it's basically a worship unto the lord for the life that was given and the life that was taken provided that's the believer mm. it's not a believer it, it's it's a really sad day to be in a funeral mm. and so we can't send anybody anywhere the moment a person closes his eyes Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and that's for the believer mm. or to wake up in Hades like the rich man in Lazarus he woke up in Hades mm. and he was in torment and suffering mm. and so whatever we do with the body firstly let me make this quite clear that the body is not unimportant mm. the body is not unimportant the body is still important because when we bury and Christians should bury by the way and not cremate when we bury it is a testimony that the body is waiting for resurrection when Christ will come again and the body and the soul will be united once again so it's a testimony waiting awaiting the day when Christ will return mm. that's why when we bury a person we put him into the ground awaiting that resurrection day yep uh, yep so sending off uh, I probably might have digressed a bit um I don't use the term I'm not too happy with the term I'm glad to say it's a funeral service unto the Lord. Yeah, well, indeed, I was. Uh, I observed that um, a lot of times uh, coming across people's uh, Facebook posts. I think, uh, I think COVID um, granted us an opportunity because things were being broadcast on social media. Uh, uh, we got to see funerals of different religions, including uh, those of Christianity. And I must say, and I've shared this with you, I was, uh, I was particularly shocked at the, at the almost the splendor of it in the sense of how much of money was being spent on on the funeral uh, and how like you just said it has to be a certain type of car and and all of that and i think i think even people who run these funeral services in uh, south africa are, are, are playing into the market of what of what they require it's a, it's a supply and demand so they're looking for these flashy cars and so forth and so on and uh, i was really i was really shocked to see that uh, it's not it's not like that here in the United Kingdom we don't have anything like that um, but the whole splendor of it and it's almost smacks of a celebrity kind of thing isn't it brother it's almost like yeah. it's, it's like you're picking up a celebrity or this kind of celebrity status um, and maybe I'm, I'm not even sure whether the person in their life had ridden in a Porsche or a Bentley or something uh, but here we have these cars with these doors flipped up and so forth and so on and uh, uh, like you said oh, sorry go on it's, it's to die for yes yes okay. yes uh, so and, and, and all of this and then obviously uh, we won't talk about the bagpipes and the other stuff that goes with it but um you and i agree in our understanding of the bible you and i understand you and i agree on the understanding of life and death and our life in god and our worship unto god you and i agree that the grand subject of all of these occasions the grand person of all of these occasions the main person of all of these occasions is not the person who has died but the main person is jesus christ correct Yes, indeed. Well, therein lies our hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Paul says that in First Corinthians 15, if Christ had not risen, those who have died have died in vain. Our preaching would be in vain. Our faith would be in vain. And he says those who have fallen asleep would have fallen asleep in vain. Mm -hmm. And so what's the point of the funeral except to declare that this is but mm -hmm. uh, the indeed. doorway to heaven, I may put it that way. Yes. That's the only hope we have in a funeral service. That's yes. what the joint will get sorrowful needs. Yes, and, and, and just to just to piggyback of what you said earlier on in, in the sense of all these PowerPoint presentations and so forth that come along uh, and and so much is spoken about the person and, and, and if you're listening to this tonight, uh, don't think we're hard hearted we're hard hearted. Don't don't think we're not being empathetic or sympathetic or loving towards the family that are that are grieving. But if you're a Christian today we know that our worship of God uh, covers all aspects of life and um, 
even even at a funeral service, the, the main focus should be on the worship of the Lord our God. And we talk less about the person who's died and more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And more in the sense of who he is and what he promised. Yeah. Uh, that that we save by grace through faith in Christ. That we save from him and for him. We save by him, from him and for him. And that needs to be made clear at the funeral service. Uh, so we look mm -hmm. not so much at the, the casket. We look not so much at the one who lies in the casket. We look not so much at the PowerPoints and uh, all the, uh, the the testimonies and the eulogies that come. The way everywhere everyone begins to speak about how good the person is, you know. Um, uh, but when we construct our funeral services, like with Brother Adrian and myself, and if, you, if you're listening to this today and you want to know more about it, uh, please uh, drop us a message and we'd love to talk to you about it. And when we construct these uh, funeral services, we go into it knowing and understanding that the main focus is the worship of the Lord our God. The main focus, the grand subject, is Jesus Christ. The grand subject of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is Jesus Christ. And so we make sure that in all our funerals and even our weddings, and even our weddings, yes. that the main person is Jesus Christ. And so um, just that's just to piggyback off my, what my brother Andrew was saying. Do you want to conclude that point, brother? Do you have anything else to add? Um, so much to add, but I think we'll, let's move on. The next points we don't have too much time. Okay, uh, so we we yeah. also we also came across this uh, this uh, matter where one person wrote, um, one person wrote that um, he says, uh, Pastor Silver Moodley fought a good fight. Uh, you finished your race. Well done, good and faithful servant of the Most High God. Now, when I, when I read that, I, I I have to ask myself, who 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 qualifies this person to say to Silver Moodley, Well done, good and faithful servant. Um, even Paul, um, in First Corinthians chapter four, speaking of his life, says that um, no human really can say how good I am or bad I am. It's God ultimately who says, "Well done, good and faithful servant." And so, when we're praying about that, it is our prayer that we would hear that, "Well done, good and faithful servant." But it's other presumptuous from an earthly point of view that someone would say, "Oh, this is Silver Moodley," and God will say to him, "Well done." A good and faithful servant. I think there's a lot of things that um, Silver Moodley did um, and preached and taught that are not good, that's not wholesome, it's not biblical, it's not sound doctrine, it's extra biblical revelation. Um, Adrian was touching on it er earlier on, talking about his declaring and decree, but also the other matter. Uh, and we can, we don't have time to go into each and every one of his things that he taught. If you go back to our um, broadcast we did almost 579 days ago, uh, you'll find that uh, uh, we did a broadcast and we looked we looked at various clips of what he preached, uh, Silver Moodley preached, and, and we used that to uh, to talk about his false doctrine. And one of the things he he preached about was um, that he Silver Moodley was a little god, and he would teach others. He would preach to others that they were little gods. Uh, he's taking his text from the book of John, the tenth chapter, verse thirty-four, where uh, Jesus makes Jesus is quoting Psalm eighty-two, verse six, uh, concerning his deity. He says. Uh, have you not read? Have you not heard? You are little gods. And so, he, you know, Silver Moodley has taken this teaching from the Americans like Kenneth Copeland and uh, Jesse Duplantis. And I think it originated way before that, Adrian, if I'm, if I'm correct. Did it originate with um, a Hagen guy? Hagen, Hagen is the father of the Word of Faith movement. So right. all of these things started off there. And then Kenneth Copeland and then uh, Kenneth Copeland was a student of Hagen. And then uh, Krefro Dollar was a student of Copeland. Yeah. And so... Where we get Sarah. Yeah, so, so as, uh, as Copeland would say, as Hagen, uh, sorry, Kefro Dollar would say, horses get together, they beget horses. Yeah. Cows come together, they beget cows. When, so the Godhead comes together, they beget little gods. Mm. And in that says when heresies beget heresies for them as well. So, yeah, it's just the same thing that has been spewed out from Kenneth Hagen days. Yeah, so Silver Midley would teach that he's a little god. He would teach his people that they are little gods. They have the power within them to speak things into existence, to create things, to recreate yeah. things. And they would speak over finances, they would speak over um, the limbs of the body. And, and, and you'd hear people like Kenneth Copeland even talk to a bald-headed man and say, hair, grow now, and uh, silly things like that. Uh, absolutely silly. Uh, but people would be enthralled with things. <laughs> yes, I could. Okay, I, I, I see you, I hear you. <laughs> um, so Kenneth Copeland would say things like that, you know, uh, um, hair grow now and things like that. 
Um, so we went through the phase, and we, we, we don't see too much of it these days with uh, Copeland and um, people like Dollar. But earlier on in late, late 90s, early 2000s, middle of the 2000s, we'd, we had those things with um, Leroy Thomas and, and the other guys who would say, money cometh now, and things like that, where they were calling these things into existence, speaking those things uh, into existence, which they thought they were speaking things into existence, because they were following this doctrine of little gods. Now, Siva Mudli was an yeah. advocate of that, uh, to such a point where, um, as a little god, I think he said that he was able to um, travel through time and space from his house in Johannesburg to a house in Durban. Uh, and and um, I think he took that up from maybe Todd Bentley, because I heard Todd Bentley speak about that once, where he was transformed from his body from where he was to another place, and he had conversations with other people. Now, what I realized, brother, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of these people are borrowing from each other this false doctrine. They hear an American speak it, they hear an American teach it, and they try to do the same thing. So I've, I've heard Simon said that in one of our, one of his clips, and I, we, you know, we played it the last time we got together. Uh, now that's absolutely heretical. That's that's crazy doctrine. But yet people believe it and get enthralled by it. And there's mm. this there's this wonder in their eyes as they look at these men who say, "Oh, we've been transported from one place to the next." What is the what is the main reason for this kind of wholesale belief? Is it not that they do not know their own Bibles, uh, brother? That's true. And um, what you're touching on is found in Romans chapter 4, which is, I would say, one of the most misrepresented and misunderstood verses regarding decreeing and declaring. And what you mentioned there is found in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, if I'm not mistaken. Verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom you believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Mm. Now, I remember praying this prayer in my Pentecostal days. Lord, we call those things that are not yep. as though they were. Yep. I used to say that a lot. Quoting from Romans 4, actually, to be honest with you, when I did say it, I didn't know it was found in Romans 4 for starters. Right. But what's happening in Romans 4 is this verse where we can call things into existence, things that are not as though they were. Mm. But we forget two attributes here of God that is not shareable or not communicable, that belongs to God and God alone. Number mm -hmm. one, he calls those things that are not as that do not exist into existence. He's speaking of God as creator, creating things ex nihilo, out mm. of nothing. Mm. That means the worlds did not exist. Nothing in the world existed existed. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be grass and trees and animals and creeping things. God created from nothing and spoke those things into existence. Mm -hmm. No man, no mortal, mere man can do those things. And it also says he can speak life to the dead and call, speak life to the dead. And that's talking about God in redemption when he awakens that man dead in his sin. Yep. No man can give salvation to another man. This is God who can uh, give fleshy hearts to stony hearts, as Ezekiel 36 would say. Mm. And so those two attributes, again, belongs to God. But what have we done? We have deified man. That's what they do here. They overestimate their authority. They overestimate their ability. And because of what you mentioned earlier, the little God's doctrine, he says, if God can do it, mm. I'm a little God, so can I. Yeah. Now, brother, dear, I will, I wouldn't say shave my head ball, that'll be a silly bit to take. <laughs> I would, you can ask for anything from me, if you can show me one man who created something out of nothing. Yeah. One man, even Kenneth Hagen or anyone in TVN, from nothing created something that did not exist. Yeah. Don't call a car into existence because cars are existed at a certain time. We see it calling from nothing the thing that didn't exist at all. That means we never knew of its existence. Yep. That's what Romans 4 is all about. And then go to a man who is dead in his sin. Yeah. Give him salvation. Mm -hmm. And they know that's blasphemous if they say they can do that. Yeah. It's only God can do that. Yeah. That's the misrep. Where, where does this start from? Misunderstanding what the text is saying. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, well, wonderful. Uh, we're, we're winding down now. We're coming towards the end. It's been almost an hour now. And... Um, so thank you for your for your comments. Thank you for uh, sharing or what's on this uh, platform. We look forward to um, obviously hearing from you even after you play this once we once we've finished and done with this broadcast today. 
uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, or those of you that are watching um, who may not be Christians, we welcome you today. And uh, we love to have an open conversation, Brother Adrian and I. We've been doing this for quite a while now. We not be, we may not be the best in uh, you know tech savvy in bringing this to you today, uh, but we hope you'll see beyond uh, our, our uh, imperfections in broadcast. Uh, but hopefully the content of this will be uh, a blessing to you also to, in a way, uh, prick your conscience, in a way, um, poke at your heart to see whether you belong to a church like this, a church like Siva Mudlis. Was, uh, are you sitting under a false gospel? Are you sitting under a man who's making these kinds of ungodly declarations to you on a Sunday morning? Uh, we want to just encourage you, um, friends, today, if you're watching, um, you, you can be sitting in a church where, like Brother Adrian and I, uh, you will not hear very many amens being said. Uh, but because people are listening to what is what they're preaching, they're uh, receiving it through their ears, they're processing it in their mind. God, by the Spirit, is helping them that it may be branded upon their hearts. They're listening, they're going home, they're discussing it with their families, uh, learning what the pastors taught and, and adding to that week by week and, and uh, being transformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ by being more familiar with the text, be more familiar with what the Word of God says. And I say that in this context, if you belong to a church where the preacher hardly ever opens his Bible, but there's a whole lot of shouting going on, and there's a whole lot of amens going on, and there's a whole lot of slap somebody with a high five going on. If you're a part of that church, they're just filling it with absolute nonsense. They're filling the time with nonsense. In the same way a church tries to fill their service time with lots of music. And that's not good teaching. That's not what you need to hear week after week. You need to hear sound teaching from the man who can rightly divide God's word. And he must be able to feed you from that which he has been fed by sanctification through the week in his study of God's word. And he, as, as the Lord has transformed his life by the study of God's word, he brings that word to the congregation on a Sunday morning of the Lord's day to bring to God's people that their lives and may be more enriched, that they may be more sharpened, that they, be, that they may be more equipped for the work of service in the kingdom of God. But if there's a whole lot of shouting going on, and you walk out of a service and you say, whew, that was a great service. I ask you to think and think again. What is so great about it? You know, Did you hear God's word? Were you taught God's word? Was it rightly divided? Uh, and those are some of the things you need to, 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 to ask yourself. So move beyond just the rhetoric. Move beyond just... Um, those those catchy catchphrases that you hear. What are, brother, what are some of those catchphrases we hear today? I, I, I've forgotten some of them, or maybe I, maybe I, I didn't mention them. Oh, which, which is it? This? Look, those those things, those things we hear in the services. In this, in, you know, slap somebody with a high five, tell somebody, I don't know, some of those things we used to hear. Uh, I think I'm out of that circle too long now. <laughs> you must There's a lot that you're yeah. I'm not even sure. Yeah, well, I, I saw I saw a sermon from a church in Chatsworth the other day, and they were doing the very same thing, to, you know, slap somebody with a high five and things like that. And so, um, then, say again. Look to your neighbor and tell them. Yeah, you look to your neighbor and tell them this and tell them that. Listen, there's no time yeah. for that. What you need, what you need, is a pastor who can open God's word, and takes you straight to the text and shows you Christ in the text, and from that to bring an application for your life. It, you need someone like that. And if you are not a part of the church like yet, where they're filling it with all sorts of programs and songs to just pass the time, uh, you need to rethink where you are. And if you'd like us to help you to find a church, please do let us know. We're coming towards the end of this um, broadcast or podcast or whatever way you want to call it. We're so thankful that you joined us. We'll end with this. One of the posts that we read says, uh, Silver Moodley has left a, a good legacy. I, I've heard that even before. He's left a legacy. Now, I don't think it's a good legacy at all. Uh, I don't think it's anything uh, worthy to talk about in the sense of, well, he's he's left things that uh, people can look at and say we've learned from this, and uh, you know we can we can grow from that. His legacy is really false doctrine, isn't it, brother? Yes. What's a true legacy to start off with? The legacy is the gospel. The legacy is teaching people who God is, who he is in Christ as as, as the redeemer and how he has given us the Holy Spirit to be more like Christ. Mm. That's what our entire predestination is for. We were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In the Old Testament, there's a nice uh, scene that good legacy, if you want legacy, mm. by any means. He says, Charlie, he speaks to the fathers and say, 
there's ancient sayings, which is in the Bible. That's what the ancient text is. Tell it to your children. Tell, tell it to your children, children. Yep. So that they could tell it to the children yet unborn, the glorious deeds of the Lord and mm. what he has done. That means Amen. who God is and what he's accomplished in, a, in, in redemption for his people. Mm. And Deuteronomy chapter 6 says the same thing to their fathers. Day and night, if you can, whether you're sitting at your table or walking by the wayside, whatever you're doing, tell them who God is and what he has done. Mm. That's a good legacy. Yep. Not what car you drove, mm. how big your bank balance is, because when you die, you take nothing away with you. Mm. And so the sad thing is men these days are measured by that. It's called a legacy of a big church, a legacy of uh, ministries. Yeah. If they're faithful, praise be to God. Yeah. But it's still not your legacy because it's the body of Christ. Yeah. And DIU or me or any pastor did not die for the flock. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, Christ died for his flock. Yeah. We did not die. We were just made overseers of the flock. Yep. And so that's a legacy. A legacy can be summed up in Paul in Acts 20 and verse 24. I account my life of no value, no as precious to myself, mm. except that I testify to the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And what legacy does Paul have? He says, there's no value in my life. Yeah. Look to me. The only thing that you must find worthy in me is that is when I imitate Christ. And so mm. imitate me if I'm in it, imitating Christ. If I'm not, then don't do anything else. And so mm. if we look at Silver Modley and Christ, we find chalk and cheese. Yep. We yep. find chalk and cheese. We have a man who has a very good place to lay his head, but Christ nowhere to lay his head. Yep. We have a man with all of the riches, and we have Christ who has a baby born in a stable next to animals in a smelly place. Uh, a man who is given honor in this earth is Silver Mudley, Christ who is despised, rejected. Mm. Man who's with no guile in his mouth, and yet any of these word of faith preachers, if you confront them, they have a lot of words to say to you. So we yeah. have chalk and cheese, and so how can that be a legacy? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you're right, and I just want to piggyback of what you said You know, uh, in the last few seconds. Uh, you know, Christ rode in on a borrowed donkey, uh, and had his last supper in a borrowed room, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Um, and yeah. we made that clear last year when we spoke of uh, another minister in Durban and his lavish birthday, uh, where he pulled up in a in a Rolls Royce, and and all of the glitz and glamour of the of the celebrity lifestyle. And you know it breaks our heart, brother. Um, for those of you that are watching, um, my brother and I, my brother Adrian and I, it breaks our heart to see so many of our kindred folk um, honoring and adoring and almost exalting these men to deity status uh, in their communities. And um, we pray that the Lord would open your eyes. We uh, in no means you know, say that uh, we are the ones to do it. If you're listening to this tonight, or whenever you're listening to this by way of repeat or whatever, uh, we appeal to you um, to ask yourself wherever you are, in whichever church you are, am I in a Am I in a church that's sound biblically? And if you don't know what that's what that means, um, to be in a biblically sound church, please will you just do us this great favor and honor of of connecting with us? I would love to talk to you. Would love to share with you uh, what to look for in a church. Would love to share with you how to find a church. Uh, We'd love to share with you uh, what to look for in the church that you're in to make sure that it is uh, biblically sound. And, and if it be that you need to leave, uh, where do you go? And then how do you look for that church? What do you need to look for when you're looking for a church? Please, we we beg you. Um, there is help available. Talk to us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, that we can best help you to um, to glorify the Lord in these days that God has given you uh, by being part of a church that honors God, uh, the way a scripture is the highest authority in the church. Uh, not man, but scripture is the highest authority. Now, you you know just as well as I do, my dear friends, that you go to churches where the name Jesus is in lights all over and the, the church will tell you that they're honoring Jesus. But really open your eyes and see, they're not honoring Jesus. They're honoring a man. They're honoring his wife. They're honoring their family, their, their pastor's wives and their family. And, and you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but are they truly honoring Jesus Christ. It's the word at the highest place it should be in that church. Um, you find if it's not that, then please, we'd love to, we'd love to hear from you, brother. We'd like to bring this to an end. Is there any concluding uh, thoughts from your side? 
Sure. James chapter 4 and verse 14 says that our lives are but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Amen. We must understand, as Peter describes about Christians in, in, his, in his writings in the New Testament, that we are pilgrims and sojourners. And as pilgrims and sojourners, we hold very loosely the things of this world. Mm. Like the songwriter says, the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Mm. In fact, we are uncomfortable in this world. We are restless in this world. And like Paul says about creation in Romans 8, we too are waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Mm. And so there's only one way to get to that celestial city in that's described for us in Revelation 21. And we all want to be there. We want to be in a place where there's no more suffering, no more crying, no more death. And John writes about that in Revelation 21, that that's when God is going to be dwelling in our midst. We will be his people and he will be our God. That's the great picture of mm. heaven. Mm. But to get there for that eternity, we must understand that our lives are but a vapor and we have but this very, very short moment. Paul calls it even a moment carry light affliction to endure in this fallen world. This fallen world is fallen because of Adam's sin in Genesis chapter 3. He has plunged this world into ruin and darkness because of his disobedience to God. And he represents us because we are no better. We would have done the same had we been put in Adam's place. He, stand, he stands there as our federal head. God is good and God is gracious. And from Genesis 3, he provided a, a, a savior. He promised a savior that will come in the fullness of time to save us from this fallen world. And Christ has come and he has saved us. And all of Christ's preaching was about the kingdom of God. It was about repentance. And he gives to us that commission just before he ascends into heaven, going to all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, mm. not make covetous, selfish people who want to gain more for themselves. He says, be like me, I'm lowly and humble, not arrogant. And so we must preach the gospel, we must make disciples and prepare people for heaven yeah. because the time is short. Indeed. And you do not have much time, as much as you lie to yourself, there's coming a day when you and I will stop breathing. Yeah. And it won't matter what cars we have or what houses we have or how much money is in the bank or what people think of us. The question that will dawn upon our hearts at that time, am I right with God? Indeed. Tonight, when you put your head upon the pillow, um, you go to bed tonight, what is your comfort? What is your only comfort in life and in death, my dear friends? If you ask yourself that question tonight, what is your only comfort in life and in death? While our only comfort in life and in death, hopefully you will say this, that I belong wholeheartedly, fully to God. Um, and if that, if that is not your confession, if that is not your portion, uh, then please, we urge you to pray and seek the Lord uh, while he may be found. Um, we thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Uh, lovely to have your comments. Great to have people from uh, South Africa uh, connect and some people from outside of South Africa connect. Always a great joy to be with my brother. Uh, not only uh, do we have an opportunity to share with others what we've learned, but uh, amongst us also between him and me uh, to share with each other uh, and encourage each other in the Lord. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. And the Lord be Lord be with you until we'll talk again. Bye for now. Amen. Amen.